Welcome back everyone to Slithering Salamander Scapes. I hope you all had a great holiday season and a safe and healthy new year. Today I'm excited to share with you a new video that I created. I was actually trying to upload this prior to the holidays, but with the hustle and bustle of everything, I just didn't get a chance. It is a care guide on a species that is near and dear to my heart, a salamander of course, and that is the Pseudotriton ruber, more commonly known as the red salamander. So today what I'm gonna do is share with you a 2000 foot overview of the animal so you have a good idea of what it is and also uh, how to take care of it and uh, care guide. So this animal I like for many reasons. One is the amazing vibrant colors that it has. Two, uh, they are voracious predators and I love watching them uh, go after their food and their habitat. It is amazing to watch. And three, just the wide variety of habitats that I found these animals in over the years. Uh, and so just a very versatile species and um, one of my favorites, uh, if not my favorite. So uh, with that, let's kick this video off. All right, so let's start with understanding where the red salamander sits within the amphibian universe. Red salamanders are lungless salamanders, meaning they breathe through their skin as adults and are in the Plethodontidae family. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, I never really am. As I mentioned previously, their scientific name is Pseudotriton ruber. And there are four subspecies, which you can see here. All right, so the first of the subspecies and the most widely distributed uh, is the Pseudotriton ruber ruber, which is the northern red salamander. Uh, this one actually can grow the largest of all up to about seven inches, uh, is red to bright orange in color uh, with black spots and has a bit of black flecking on the chin. Um, when these are younger, they tend to be more vibrant, more of an orangey, uh, bright red. And then as they get older, the color dulls just a little bit. Next subspecies on the list is the Pseudotriton ruber nititis, uh, which is a blue ridge red salamander. This subspecies has very little spotting versus the other subspecies and little to no black flecking on the chin. I've actually never caught one of these in the wild and do not want and don't so therefore don't have any pictures. Um, you can Google it and look. I just don't want to infringe on anyone's copyright by pulling a picture out of a book or something. Next subspecies here on the list is the Pseudotriton ruber schnecki. Uh, this is a black chin red salamander, which resembles the northern red, but in my opinion, it has much more vibrant colors uh, and darker flecking under the chin, which thereby they get their name. I actually keep several of these. These are an absolute favorite of mine. They are amazing animals. The last subspecies here on the list is the Pseudotriton ruber viasque. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, or the southern red salamander. Uh, overall, this is duller in color versus the other subspecies mentioned and lives at the far uh, range in the south. As with the Blue Ridge, I do not have a picture of this because I've never caught one. And so, again, don't want to infringe on any copyrights. But if you want to see it, uh, just Google it. And there are some really cool pictures of them. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, geography and habitat. In terms of geography, they're widely distributed from southern New York west to about Indiana and south towards the Gulf Coast. The northern reds are the most widely dispersed from up north through the East Coast and Appalachian Mountains, and abundant versus the other subspecies. Southern Reds are in the deeper south, while the Blue Ridge are not surprisingly in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Southern Virginia and North Carolina. The Black Chin Reds are within the Southern Appalachians in both North and South Carolina and Tennessee as well. They are, however, notably absent from the coastal plains along the East Coast. In terms of habitat, adults can be found in both terrestrial and aquatic habitats, including woodland forest floors and on the margins of cool seeps and streams. In my experience and personally, I have found them under logs, rocks, under large patches of moss and rotting tree bark. I have also observed them in the water in cool, clear streams in which they had burrowed down into the sediment of the banks of those streams. In my opinion, and through my own observations, they seem to be able to tolerate a wide variety of habitats, likely depending on temperature and time of the year. Let's talk a little bit about breeding. I'm not gonna really get into great detail here, but I will provide an abbreviated summary. From what I've read and observed, breeding can occur anytime except during the coldest months of the year. Uh, that said, in the area I live and grew up in, breeding tends to occur in the fall. Females will lay their eggs in water, so you know, think fog, spring seepages, things like that. The eggs are typically deposited under a rock or some similar structure. And once they, they hatch, the larva will prey on insect larval worms and other invertebrates. Lar the larval period can last anywhere from one and a half to three and a half years, at, at which point they develop into young adults and you lose their feathery gills and will become semi-aquatic semi terrestrial. So you've made the decision to, to keep a red salamander. That's great. Keeping a red salamander is not necessarily hard, but it does require planning, research, and routine maintenance. If you can do those things and commit to that, 
then you will have an amazing animal to observe for years to come. I would say that keeping a red salamander is not necessarily a beginner amphibian. When I say that, I don't mean that it is super hard, but there are certain things that need to be spot on, including water quality, temperature, and things like that. Uh, I also would say it's not the hardest amphibian to keep, but if you're gonna endeavor to keep one of these, then take the time, do the research, make sure that you know what you're getting into beforehand and that you can keep a suitable environment for the animal to be healthy and happy. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the first thing, uh, which is the housing. And one of the most interesting thing about keeping these is that I've seen them successfully kept in both aquatic and terrestrial closures. A lot of the decision will really be based on what stage of life you acquire the animal in. If the animal's in larval form, then clearly you will require some form of aquatic habitat and also have an area for the animal to get out of the water as it matures. That being said, you're probably wondering what you're gonna need to successfully keep these. Housing. Uh, while these animals don't require a ton of space, I like to give my animals a lot of room to move around and explore. There's really no reason not to spoil them. For one or two salamanders at a bare minimum, I would recommend at least a 20 gallon tank. For instance, I keep one northern red by itself in a 20 gallon tall that I turned into a drip wall. On the other hand, I keep three black chin red salamanders in a 40 gallon breeder with both aquatic and terrestrial areas. The aquatic area is larger than I would have normally made because when I got the animals, all of them were in the aquatic form still. Honestly, I will likely upgrade them as they continue to grow. As I mentioned before, a lot of the, the setup will depend on the stage of life that the animal is in. Water quality is the absolute biggest hurdle. Water quality is really the biggest hurdle when having any type of water feature. Firstly, and always make sure that you use dechlorinated water. I use uh, a mixture of dechlorinated tap water and RO water in my setups. You'll want to also have a good filter, so think external canister filter or internal filter that has the capacity to exceptionally clean the water. Depending on what kind of filter, make sure that you adhere to routine maintenance in terms of cleaning it out. I use external canister filters in all my setup and clean them every four to six months or as needed. In addition, the water should be well aerated so you can always think of adding an air stone as well. I like to always make sure that the water is moving and that there are no dead spots. I typically also will change the water every few weeks or as needed. Don't forget to also routinely test the water to make sure that the nitrites and nitrates are not too high and also make sure that the other basic parameters are in check. In terms of aquatic substrate, I would recommend cleaned rocks and sand or pebbles. Make sure to clean the rocks and substrate prior and sterilize as appropriate. You can add non-toxic aquatic and semi-aquatic plants like mosses if you like. If you do go with this type of setup, make sure that there are places where the salamanders can crawl out of the water as they are not totally aquatic once adults. Terrestrial setups are much easier to put together and less to worry about in terms of the water quality problems. Substrate used can consist of dried sphagnum moss, coconut fiber, organic top, top or potting soil with no chemicals whatsoever, and bark chips. The substrate should be moist but not saturated. Make sure to include pieces of wood and or rocks for hiding places. Remember, these animals are very covert and having an abundance of places to hide will help keep them less stressed. In terms of plants, there are many things that you can use. Again, making sure that whatever plants that you, you use are non-toxic for amphibians. I typically will find mosses and liverworts in nature. Additionally, I'll use a mix of ferns and oak leaf creeping fig, golden pothos in the water to help filter it. And this is where you can really, your shape creativity can really shine if you have a green thumb. Many people who have this type of setup will place a bowl of water in the enclosure for the salamander to soak in if it wishes. And while it's not aesthetically pleasing necessarily, the bowl of water is important if you have no water feature built in. If you're able to keep the enclosure very humid with a misting system, then there is plenty of water being sprayed on a daily basis. You may not need a bowl. But note that it is better safe than sorry if you are a beginner and unsure if it is humid enough. It is my preference to have pallidariums for these animals, which incorporates both land and water, which you've been seeing here. And it's while it's a little bit harder and more maintenance, I think it replicates the salamander's natural habitat more closely than just one or the other. One of the most important thing is lids. It's pretty boring, but it's very, very, very important in keeping any salamander. I would recommend one of the following. One, an acrylic lid cut to size with ventilation holes drilled. Make sure that the acrylic does not warp. If it does, that means you probably need a thicker piece of acrylic. Two, polycarbonate lids cut to size with ventilation holes. And number three, screen lids, as you can see here, that are tight fitting. If the animal can fit its head through, it can get through. Believe me, they can and will escape. And there's a 99% chance that you'll never find them as they will shrivel up and die somewhere in long, some long forgotten corner of your house. Believe me, I know from experience. As you can see, I've caught this one climbing and it will absolutely try to escape.
Temperature is super important, and I feel that this is often overlooked. These salamanders prefer cool temps, so 80 degrees is absolutely not okay. I keep my salamanders from the high 50s in the winter to the high 60s in the summer, maybe low 70s. They will not do well in higher temperatures, so make sure you have the ability to keep them in the proper temperature zone with always erring on the side of cooler is better. Let's talk about feeding. Food will really depend on the stage of life the animal is in. Clearly trying to replicate what they eat in the wild is great, but really tough to do in reality. I found the most success with live black worms, for instance, when they are in larval form, as you can see here. As they grow, they will begin to take slightly larger prey, including small earthworms, crickets, and an occasional waxworm. Note that I dust the crickets and waxworms with Rapashi calcium and vitamin supplement in order to get the animals as much of the needed vitamins and nutrients that they require. Today I feed them all of the things I just mentioned, with earthworms really being the primary staple of their diet. I've noticed them grow at a healthy clip and not exhibit any signs of malnutrition. Keep in mind that I am not an expert on this, just sharing my experiences. In terms of feeding frequency, I would feed several times a week when they are small and growing, and once they get larger and begin to mature, I feed them about every week. There's really no rule to this, you just don't want to over or under feed the animals. In terms of diseases, I'm going to caveat everything I'm about to say with the statement that I'm not a veterinarian. Most salamanders in general are very sensitive to their environment. Salamanders and amphibians in general, really, are indicator species. The slightest change in your enclosure could have a not so in good impact on the salamander. They're susceptible to all kinds of things, including viruses, fungal infections, bacterial infections, not to mention physical harm from tank mates. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole today on amphibian diseases, but we'll outline things that I've observed when a salamander is sick. First thing, animal is not eating and acting lethargic. Two, the animal is sitting out in the open and not hiding. That's completely uncharacteristic of them. Three, red sores on the animal's body. Four, white patches developing on the body. Five, fuzzy looking material surrounding the animal's limbs, tail, or other parts of their body. Everything I just described includes everything from bacterial and fungal infections and viral infections as well. There are some things you can do to try to treat the animal, but I am not a vet, so I'm not going to articulate that today. The first thing you should do is find a good hurt vet that is hopefully not too far from where you live that's experienced and consult them. Even for the most experienced scientists and keepers of these animals in zoos, this can be very challenging. Proper husbandry of these animals should be practiced to avoid any of the aforementioned issues. But inevitably, these things can and will happen on occasion, so have a vet you can consult with. Let's talk a little bit about my tank setups. So as I mentioned, I have a northern red salamander housed in a 20 gallon tall, and then I also have three black chin red salamanders in a 40 gallon paludarium. Keep in mind when I got all these animals, they were much smaller and in larval form, and they've been growing nicely over the last year or so. There's a good chance I'm gonna probably upgrade both of these tanks at some point over the next couple of years. The 20 gallon tall that you're looking at now houses my northern red salamander. I've included the DIY link in the description in case you wanna know how I built it. Basically what I did was I have a bulkhead in the lower left corner that sucks the water out into a Fluval 207 canister filter and then returns the water to a different bulkhead at the top, which is attached to a hose, which is foamed under the rocks and distributes the water along the background and the sides. There is a small island in the middle with a cork bark piece for the salamander to get out if it needs to. In terms of plants, I have various aquatic mosses like java moss and flame moss, and I have mixed that in with liverworts. In addition, I have a creeping fig and a small fern in here as well. Unfortunately, recently I had a cyanobacteria outbreak in here and I had to, that I had to wipe out with an agent that basically starves the bacteria so all the plants wouldn't die. I removed the salamander for about a week and then did several water changes and now everything looks pretty good. I also utilized several olive nerites as my cleanup crew in this tank. And I should also mention that I'm using a Nicru LED light with a proper spectrum for plant growth. My northern red has gotten to be fairly large over the last 18 months, so I will be absolutely thinking about upgrading his enclosure in the near future. Lastly, I should mention that I have a tight-fitting screen lid on top of this, which I showed earlier, which makes escape impossible for this animal, as he always, always loves to climb. The black chin reds that I have are in a 40-gallon breeder that I mentioned earlier. I've also included the DIY link for this paludarium build in the description in case you want to see how I built it. I have a similar setup with the bulkheads attached to a Flu Fluval 207 canister filter. The lid on this one is actually glass, and what it, what it, which what it came with, but it also has a small plastic piece, and it offers no place for the salamanders to escape. Once or twice a day, I open the lid for ventilation, and it keeps the proper humidity that I need. One of the salamanders, despite his massive size, is still in larval form and lives entirely in the aquatic area of the tank. In terms of 
the aquatic plants, I have several aquatic mosses, including Java and flame moss. I have dwarf Sagittarius. I have Anubia, Anubius, excuse me, not a petite, and a golden pothos, which helps me to also filter some of the water. I have several mono shrimp and olive nerites, and those guys act as my cleanup crew for the water section. The terrestrial part consists of mosses, creeping fig, and a bird's nest fern. I've actually had to use an aquatic substrate on the land portion, including gravel and fluval stratum, as there is an ongoing super annoying leak. Luckily, I built in a way to drain the water from the false bottom so the water doesn't, doesn't stagnate, but it is an ongoing maintenance issue and one that I really need to take care of. In addition to this, I also unfortunately had a really bad cyanobacteria problem in this one as well. So I had to undergo the same treatment that I did with a previous tank. If you don't know what cyanobacteria it is, it's also called by its common name, blue-green algae. It has a distinct smell and comes off in sheets when you scrape it. To be honest, I've been thinking about redoing this tank and this would be the third time that I've had to do it and fix this leak. That said, I still need an, an adequate aquatic section as I mentioned earlier, as I still have one of the salamanders in larval form. That said, I'm gonna continue to look at and think about redoing this tank in the near future. Oh, and the cleanup crew on the land is mainly temperate springtails. Last thing I'll mention is that I'm using a night crew LED light for this tank as well. And I have the lights on at about eight or nine hours a day. In closing, these animals are amazing to observe and keep, as long as you are willing to put in the time and research to maintain an appropriate habitat. They are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They are super interactive and I always have an amazing time observing and I'm entertained watching them when I enter the room to feed them. Overall, this species may be my favorite out of all of the amazing salamanders out there. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to watch this and appreciate your support for the channel. If, if you like this video and you are not subscribed, hit that subscribe button for more great content. I'm looking forward to sharing and uploading some more amazing content this year. Until then, peace out and stay safe and healthy. Thank you.